As you're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 13, a lot of you guys know this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. You know, my question to start with you, to start for all of us here this, this evening, is how do we respond to crisis in our lives? All of us, if not right now, are going through some type of crisis in our life. And it can be in our marriages. It can be financial. It can be a lot of different things that we experience. And, and my question with that is, how do we respond to a crisis in our life? Do we respond in such a way that calls for obedience in our life? Obedience to the Lord. Or do we respond in such a way where there can be hints of disobedience? You know, a lot of times when uh, I'm going through a crisis, and usually my wife goes through crisis, and it's usually because of me. <laughs> and a lot of times I'm like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. And instead of turning to the Lord, my actions can lead to disobedience. I can put God aside and say, Lord, I, I got this covered. I don't really need you. I don't turn to his word. I don't turn to prayer. And a lot of times we can do the same thing when going through crises, which are acts of disobedience. Because Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. So this evening, I want us to take a walk through 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to see... Saul, the king of Israel, who has just been appointed king, go through extreme crisis. So what I want to do is read verse 1, give you a brief history lesson up to this point of what's going on in 1 Samuel chapter 13, and then get into our study. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, comma, the writer's going to go on in verse 2 and, and tell us what he's about to do. But in order to clearly understand the events that are coming up to chapter 13 as they unfold here, we need to recall a couple of important instructions that the prophet Samuel has given to Saul. Now, Saul has been newly appointed king. When you look in chapter 10, you will see that it was Samuel, the prophet, who anointed Saul as king, and this was the request of the people. The people had come to Samuel, who was the prophet from the Lord, and God, who was their king, leading them through the enslavery of Egypt and through the Ammonites and through the Philistines. It was God who gave them victory. But now the people of Israel are requesting a king. And not only are they requesting a king, they're requesting a king as, other, of, as all the other nations, making the request sinful because they wanted to reject God and they now wanted a pagan king to lead them. And the reason for the request is found in chapter 10 is that we want a king that will lead us into battle. Now, I don't know about you guys, but every battle I've been in, if I try to go into that battle alone, I'm guaranteed to face defeat. And I don't know if you guys have ever experienced battle on your own. It doesn't work out very well. And God has been faithful, as that song we just said, you've been faithful all my life. That time after time, God's track record of fighting our battles is undefeated. And time after time, God has come through in some tremendous ways in our lives, especially through crisis. And the people wanted a king, just like the other nations. God, we don't need you. God, we're going to do this ourselves. So Samuel goes to the Lord, and the Lord says, give the people what they want. Give them what they're asking for. But set some rules in what the king's going to do. So up to this point, as Saul, Saul is newly reigned, we saw here in verse 1 that he reigned one year, and during his second year, he's now going to be faced with a crisis. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel, the prophet Samuel gives Saul two instructions. 
He says in chapter seven, chapter 10, verse 7, he says, you've been called king for one specific purpose, and it's to defeat the Philistines. Because the people wanted a king that would lead them into battle. And at this time, there had been a Philistine presence in one of the cities called Gibeah. And so the Philistines have been present there. They've been, they're a sworn enemy of God, and yet they were in the, in the territory of Israel, and God instructed Samuel to tell Saul, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to deal with this. You're going to deal with this presence of the Philistines that are here in the land of Israel. And the second instruction he tells them in chapter 10, verse 8, then you will go to Gilgal and wait seven days for me to come and offer sacrifices. Sounds pretty simple, right? But it's, a, it's interesting here that it tells us that it's been two years and that this Philistine presence is still in the land of Israel. He had done nothing about the Philistines, and he was instructed to do so. Given this unresolved Philistine problem, it's no surprise now as we look at verse 2 that Saul is choosing for himself an army. He's now going to start to deal of what he's been anointed as king to do. Deal with the enemy. Deal with this garrison of the Philistines that are in the land of Gibeah to deal with the enemy that has staked ground and land in God's country. And you know what's amazing about seeing something like that? It's so easy that for the enemy or for the flesh to stake claim in the land of our hearts. And oftentimes, God is wanting us to deal with it. He wants us to deal with those things that hinder our relationship with him. He wants us to deal with those things that cause us to keep our eyes off of Jesus. And here, Samuel is telling him, you must go and and battle the Philistines. And so Saul, in in verse 2, it tells us that he chooses for himself 3,000 men. 2,000 are going to be with him in Michmash, and 1,000 are going to go with his son Jonathan, at this city called Gibeah, where this Philistine garrison is at. He kept 2,000 for himself. And, and you know, when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 20, it was the people who requested a king that they may go out and fight our battles. And so now he has done nothing for two years. And it kind of reminds me, as I just mentioned, how easy it is to sweep things under the rug. When God has instructed us to deal with certain things in our lives, to deal with those things that hinder our worship to the Lord, he wants us to deal with those things that keep our eyes off Jesus. And oftentimes, we just sweep them under the rug. We just sweep them and put them aside. As a lot of you guys know that my past included drug addiction. Many years of it. I was shooting up and I, I was a mess. And you know, a lot of times when I got clean, I, when I got clean, I didn't want to get rid of that pipe. I didn't want to get rid of that syringe. I didn't want to get rid of those websites. I, I wanted to keep them there because I just kind of swept it under the rug just in case of a rainy day that I can go back to that. And God has called us to remove those things from our lives. In order for us to have true worship with with our King Jesus, we must not sweep those things under the rug. See, Saul was called to attack the Philistine garrison a year ago, but he has swept it under the rug, and now, two years later, he's begun to deal with the issue. I don't know what we've swept under the rug, but oftentimes it can be things in our relationship. I just don't want to deal with that right now, Lord. You know, you, you know my heart, God. And God's like, no, you must die to the flesh. You must put those things out and crucify them. Because what happens when we don't deal with those things that we sweep under the rug? They come back bigger and stronger, right? And here, Saul has been sweeping these things under the rug. When we look at verse 3, Oh, I'm sorry, let me go back to verse 2. 
that, uh, that as this army is being selected. But look, when you look at verse 3, and I'm going to go through these first few verses, just giving us an update, because I want to concentrate on the latter part of this. But you see in verse 3, that when all Israel had, I'm sorry, when Jonathan, it says, and Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison, this was Saul's thing to do. You know, and oftentimes we often think, well, you know, it's my wife is the one that needs to get closer to the Lord. Or, you know, I'm waiting for my kids to become a certain age and, and then, you know, then they're going to follow the ways of the Lord. And oftentimes we expect other people to do the things that God has called us to do. And here Saul was instructed to deal with the Philistine garrison and it's his son Jonathan that attacks them. And it says here that when Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines of that was in Geba, the Philistines heard of it and then Saul blew his trumpet. He is calling for war. He was one of those guys that you do the dirty work. Once the dirty work is done, I will come in and take the credit. And this is where Saul's downfall becomes, begins to spiral downhill because he, give, he takes the credit and never gives God the credit for the victory in his life. I don't know if we've ever claimed victory in our life or overcoming certain things in our lives. But oftentimes we'll say, look what I've done. And we will blow the trumpet and say, look at me. Look at all the great things that I have done. And Saul is saying, he blew the trumpet saying, we're going to go into battle. But the battle had already been done. Jonathan took it upon himself to attack the garrison of the Philistines, the very thing that Saul as king was to do. And we see here in verse, in verse 4, that Samuel, uh, that Saul takes all the credit. He shouted something in verse 3 when it says, he blew the trumpet and says, let all the Hebrews hear. Now the word Hebrews there is interesting because usually when the writer's referencing the nation of Israel, he's, he's referencing them as the children of God or the children of Israel. The, the term Hebrews was used as a derogatory term and oftentimes the Philistines would reference the, is, the Israelites as the Hebrews. And so I'm not sure why Saul is referencing the, the Israelites as Hebrews. Maybe he's seen them as the enemy sees them. But it gives us insight that Saul really never loved the people. He's referring to them in a more derogatory way. And see, if we're ever going to be used by God, we must love people. And here we see a little bit of how Saul thinks of the children of Israel. And it says here that when all Israel heard this trumpet blast and, and this hearing that Saul had said to the people, and, and we, we get some insight here to what Saul had said. He had said here uh, that all of Israel heard it and that Saul had attacked the Philistine garrison. Was it really Saul? No, it was Jonathan. But Saul's taking the credit. He's saying, look at me. Look what I've done. Look at the things that I can do. And not once do we see here, you guys, God ever mentioned. And it's a dangerous place in our lives. When we're in battle and we think that we're winning or we think that we've done something great to always remember that it is God that has given us the victory. It's nothing that we've done in ourselves. There's nothing that we have done that we are not to take the credit for because it's God who's fought the battle in our lives. And so this news spread across the land, land as Saul blows this trumpet declaring that he attacked the Philistines, which caused all of Israel to become an abomination to the Philistines. You know, when we do a work for the Lord, when we're in God's battle, when God is fighting our battles against those schemes and the wiles of the enemy to the world, we will become an abomination. And that word abomination literally means a stench. You will become a poochie to the rest of the world. <laughs> you will stink because the world does not understand that it's God that is fighting your battles. The world can under, never understand that it's God who gives us the strength when we're in crisis. And so 
The Philistines hear of this. It tells us in verse 5 that they, in response to this trumpet blast, in, this, in response of Jonathan attacking the, the Philistine garrison, the Philistines assemble a massive army. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, The Philistines gathered together to fight Israel 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand of the seashore. Wow, talking about seeing a big problem. Remember, Saul only gathered up 3,000 people for his army. And now this massive army has encamped against Saul as numerous as the sand of the seashore. I don't know what crisis you're going through this evening, but I know that it can look insurmountable. It can look daunting. It can look like a, the attack from the enemy is as numerous as the sand of the seashore. And I know when we are faced with such difficulties or faced with such daunting task, there can be a tendency for us to turn away from the Lord. When God is calling us to, when we're going through these crises, when the enemy has surrounded us in such a way that there's a multitude of people that is greater than the sand of the seashore, how do we respond? Do we respond and hang on God's promises that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you? Hang on the promises where God says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will rise up a standard against him. When you walk through the fire, I shall be with you. When you walk through the river, it shall not overtake you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not smell like a chicharron. I mean, <laughs> God is with us. And Saul is looking at the numbers by itself. And when we look at the, the way the enemy surrounds us by circumstance, when we begin to look at the things and God is not part of our lives, we're going to become overwhelmed. And so we see upon seeing this great size and strength of the, of the, of the army of the Philistines, we see here in verse 6 that they knew they were in danger, and it says they were in distress. I don't know if you've ever been distressed by circumstances. I don't know if we've ever been to a point where we want to hide. It says here that they hid in caves that they hid in the thickets and the rocks in the holes and the pits. They, they were so fearful that they were running for their lives. It says in verse 7 that some of them even crossed over the, the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. That Saul still stayed in Gilgal. But the people that followed him were trembling. Now, I don't know if any of you have been chased by the cops. I'm looking at Joe. Maybe Joe has. Looking at some Tim I know has been chased by the cops. I don't know if any of you have been chased by the cops. I have. And there was one particular time, and I shared this with our Tuesday morning men's ministry, our Bible study, that another person, and I won't discriminate this person, broke into a building. And the alarm went off. And you know, at that time I was in the world, and, and, uh, and knowing that the alarm was going off, I'm in a panic. Because I'm going to get charged with breaking and entering, receiving stolen property. I mean, the list is long. And I'm in distress. I don't know if you guys have ever been in distress. I, I don't know if you have. It, it's something that we know that when we're distressed, we, we operate in fear. And I remember being so... I, obviously, I couldn't hide in the bushes. There's no pit I could head into. We don't have caves around here or any rocks. And so I was moving, and I was afraid the cops were going to come get me. And so I'm passing this front yard, and there's a kid's bicycle about this tall. <laughs> that was there, and the tires were flat. And imagine me getting on the bicycle and try to ride away. It would have been a hilarious scene if the cops would have caught me. But I remember being in distress, that I don't care what I need to do, I just need to try to get out of here even to a point where I was riding this little kid's bike. Well, once I figured out I couldn't ride it, I left it there and I ran. But I was in distress. And I don't know if you've ever been in such a place 
by just looking at the circumstances that has caused us to be in great distress. This was a very low point for Israel. You know what's interesting? That an ungodly leader will fail to turn the people who are fear or trembling into the trust of God. Saul's failure to reassure the people's fears by exhorting them to trust in God. Faced with this numeric superior enemy, the Israelites began to panic and fear. He didn't tell the people to trust in God that he will deliver them. He didn't remind them that it was God who led them out of Egypt. He didn't remind them of the king who wanted to gouge their eyes out, the king of the Ammonites, that it was God who delivered them. They, Saul did not, uh, did not point these people to the Lord. And I want to challenge you husbands and dads and grandfathers that are here this evening. See, when our family is faced with crisis, when our children are being surrounded by the enemy, it's up to us as dads, it's up to us as husbands, it's up to us as grandparents to always lead our families to Jesus, to trust in God, because a lot of times what we begin to do is we begin to panic. And instead of turning our families to Jesus, we begin to panic and fear and begin to hide. So this is a challenge for you men to lead your families, especially in a time of crisis and especially in a time where it's daunting and it doesn't look good. And instead of running and hiding, point and Point your family to let them know that we can trust in Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So if Saul would have had the faith, he would have reminded the Israelites of all the great things that God has done. The promises that God has given the enemy, has given, uh, has given to the Israelites. The victory that God has given to all the people. And God even promises that when we put our faith and trust and hope in him, that even our enemies would fear. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 25, it says, This day I will begin to put dread and fear of you, of, of you upon the peoples of everywhere. Under the heavens, when they hear of report of you, will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Remember that we are children of God. You are a child of God bought and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so whatever we're facing this evening, know that Jesus is there to fight your battle. We see here in verse 8 that he waited seven days. Remember in chapter 10, verse 8, that Samuel instructed Saul to wait seven days. He tells him, when, when, I want you to wait seven days, and when I come back to you, I will perform the sacrifices. He waited seven days. It says here, then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. You know, waiting can be extremely difficult. I think I'm probably one of the most impatient person there is. You guys remember the old popcorn? Remember that? Now we get mad if our popcorn takes a minute to, to cook in the microwave. And most of the time it's burnt. I burnt many popcorns because of this. But we don't like waiting. I cannot stand waiting in traffic. That's why I took my Calvary Chapel Chino Valley sticker off. <laughs> and I put Calvary Chapel Chino Hills. <laughs> so I can cut people off. I don't like waiting. It bothers me. Ask my wife. I'm so impatient. And I get so frustrated when I have to wait for things. But that just seems like... That's our society today. We don't wait, especially when the Lord is saying, John, I have a plan for you. I need you to wait for me. And we're saying, no, Lord, I don't want to wait. Seven days is too long. You know, what's interesting is that Saul was in Gilgal already many months. And in the press of a current crisis, every day now seemed to go longer and longer and longer. And he knew Saul knew that the Philistines were assembling this massive army, and once they are organized and would attack, that they would be very difficult to defeat. You know, the word wait here in verse 8 
speaks about, it is best described from the original language, to linger with expectation and hope. But you know that when we are faced with a daunting crisis, that our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope isn't what it appears to look like. Our hope isn't into anything else. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And we know that seven days can pass by quickly. We know that. But when it's really a difficult time, when it's something that we're really expecting, seven days can pass really slow. And waiting on the Lord can be extremely difficult. But you know when we wait on the Lord, that waiting on the Lord is an act of obedience. In Psalm 27, 14, it says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33, the writer tells us to walk in obedience to all the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the, in the land that you will possess. Waiting. We also know, and I didn't write it down, that those who wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. See, when we're called to wait on God, it's an act of obedience. But when we begin to say, Lord, I really don't need you. I've been waiting seven days, Lord, and you have not responded to my prayer. Lord, I've been waiting seven days, and and the news that I received is still bad news. Where are you, God? And God is saying, hang on. Hold fast to me, because I have a plan for you. And oftentimes, like, no, I don't want to wait. And when we begin to have that heart, we begin to have a heart like Saul, a heart of disobedience, not trusting in God's promises. And we see here that the people here, that when Samuel didn't come in verse 8, the people were scattered from Saul. This added to Saul's anxiety. First, he was waiting for Samuel, and he was stressful as he seen the army get bigger and bigger and bigger. The second thing is that now he's seeing the people, his 2,000 people, or his army, is now being scattered. You know, it's interesting, the word scattered means, it, it, in the Greek, it means they split. That's not Greek, you guys. They left. They were fearful. Remember, they were in distress. They they saw this big army, and, and instead of trusting in the Lord, instead of having Saul point to, G, or point to the Lord, they now are beginning to scatter. And this reveals the heart of Saul. Because if he was a true shepherd, if he was the king that God has called him to be, then he would have led the people to God. And again, the importance that we lead our family in difficult time to the Lord. And so he was beginning to lose his army. See, when we don't look to the Lord, we will begin to suffer loss. We will begin to become overwhelmed. We will be distressed. And we'll have that spirit of fear that's spoken about in Timothy. That God didn't give us a spirit of fear. And in verse 9, we see here that he begins to act presumptuously. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a jam where you're not, I'm not going to wait on the Lord. I'm just going to do my own thing. And we find ourselves in trouble. And from this very act right here, this is going to be the very thing after two years of Saul's reign that God is going to pull the kingdom from Saul. Look what he does. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering to the Lord. He, but this was sinful. Why? Because God is instructed in the book of Leviticus that offerings and burnt offerings were to be only made by a priest. And Saul is beginning to do a work that he's not called to do. And this is the result of not waiting on the Lord. We begin to act presumptuously. We begin to think that we're God of our lives. And we begin to make decisions that ultimately will have consequences that are not good. And Saul disobeyed Samuel. Remember in chapter 10, verse 8, it was Samuel that said, wait for me seven days, and when I come at the appointed time, I will offer a burnt sacrifice and a peace offering. And Saul begins to panic. He begins to look at this big army. 
And he then acts on his own. And that is an act of disobedience. To go into going ahead of God's word. And this was a sin because Saul was a king. Not to do the work of the priest. Only priests were able to offer sacrifices. Saul had no business doing what a priest is called to do. He was unwill- unwilling to wait on Samuel. Saul thought that he can force God's hand by making him, by help, he can force God's help by making sacrifices of his own. You know, Moses warned the Israelites not to act presumptuously, but not to act without instruction or direction of the priest. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 12, we see the man who acts presumptuously by not listening to the priest who stands there to serve the Lord your God, nor to judge, that man shall die. Thus, you shall purge the evil from Israel. I don't know about you guys. I'm speaking to a great-looking crowd here. And I know we've never acted presumptuously, never said, Lord, I'm not going to wait seven days. And instead, Lord, I'm not going to wait seven days, but I'm going to do the things that you are called to do in my life. I'm going to do those instead. And when we think about it like that, that sounds dumb. But oftentimes we do the same thing. That the Lord has called us to wait. The Lord has instructed us to do specific things. And we're saying, Lord, you know what? I don't need to do that. I'm going to do it on my own because obviously you're not around to help me out. And this is what Saul was doing. And as Samuel comes and he notices here in verse 10, it says, now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, Samuel showed up. He came. And Saul went out to greet him, that he may greet him. Interesting what the writer's saying here. See, previously in 1 Samuel chapter 10, when the Philistines were getting ready to attack, it was Samuel who offered the burnt offering to the Lord on behalf of the people. And because of that, there was victory. God thundered and confused the Philistines, and the Israelites were able to drive them out. But it was God. And it was Samuel the priest that offered the sacrifice. So we see that Saul has seen this and used it as a gimmick to try to force God's hand to help him out. And Saul apparently presumed or supposed that he can force God to intervene by simply repeating Samuel's prior actions. Never assume. Never assume that we're following God's will when we're either disobeying his word or acting on our own. And we see here in verse 10 that as soon as this happened, guess who shows up? You know, it always seemed to me that whenever I was trying to pull a fast one on my parents, seems like whenever I would try to get away with something, they would show up. And we see here, I wonder if Samuel smelt it. This is the first recording of a carne asada cookout that we have here in the Bible. At the very moment that Saul makes this offering, this burnt offering, guess what happens? Samuel shows up. And we see here that Samuel is still, excuse me, Saul is still trying to act as he's the priest. We see this in the writing here. It says that when this happened and and he presented the burnt offering, it says that Samuel came, he shows up, and it says here that Saul went out to meet him and that he might greet him. You know, what's interesting about this is that not only did Saul act as a priest, but Saul has overstepped his boundary that he went out to bless Samuel. See, the only one that can present that can present blessings were the priest. And, Sa- and Saul went out after he presented the burnt sacrifice. He burnt the burnt offering. Now, I don't know if we know what's involved in a burnt sacrifice. You have to have an animal that's set apart for the sacrifice. And then you have to prepare it. Then you have to slit its throat. Then there's instructions to, what to do with the blood. Then there's instructions what to do with the the entrails, with the kidneys and and the fat. There's specific instructions that God gave to the Levitical priesthood for a burnt offering. And Saul, who's not even trained in that, began to do the act of a priest. And this is where the disobedience comes in. 
Because not only is he going out there, but now he went out to meet him. He went to present a blessing to him as he's a priest. And he went out there that he may greet him to say, look what I've done. I've done great. He offered the sacrifice and now he's given a blessing. It would be like somebody who gets stuck or a child who gets their hand caught in a cookie jar. And then when our parents catch us, we say, well, let's pray about it. It's like that. And Samuel says in verse 11, what have you done? What have you done? Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come from within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me on Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to him, to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. What have you done? Samuel knew something was wrong. As I mentioned, he probably smelt the burnt offering in the air. But Samuel was not looking for excuses or reasons because there were no valid reasons of why Saul would do such a thing. And Saul responded to this question defensively, blaming three other parties for his act of disobedience. The first uh, people that he blames is that when I saw the people scattered from me, he blames the people for leaving him, for his lack of leadership. He blames the people. And then he blames Samuel that you didn't come in the appointed time. And then he blames the enemies gathering together at Michmash. You know, in verse 11, when it says, Saul said. You know, this is a classic response of ex- and an excuse-making failure to trust God. Line upon line, Saul made his sin worse with excuses. And it says, when I saw the people scattered from me, in verse 11, I had to do something to try to impress the people to gain their support and their trust. As we see Saul's decay, his character decay, more and more, he begins to deceive himself even more. His second lie consisted of blaming Samuel and the soldiers of not, uh, and not himself. It was Samuel's fault for arriving late and the army's fault for deserting their king. When you see in verse 11, I saw, it says, when I saw the people, he was indicating that he was walking by sight and not by faith. And in verse 12 is the kicker. It says, then I said, I don't know about you guys, but my self-talk, I said within myself, I'm going to do this, You know how much trouble that's gotten me into? Instead of listening to the instructions of the Lord, I said to myself, I said to myself, wasn't that the reason why Jeroboam, the king of Israel at that time, set up an altar? Because he said within his heart, you know, when we begin to listen to our own heart, we're in trouble. And when we don't have God, we have not, Saul has not mentioned One word about God. He did the acts of a priest. He did the acts of a king. So, so many times we can go through the motions of being a godly or being a Christian. When in reality, when we're faced with situations like that, the first thing we want to do is we want to blame others. I was born this way. I have that gene. My grandfather did this. We, we begin to make excuses and we begin to blame others. It, it was the, the woman you gave me that Adam said. And then it was Eve who said, but it was the serpent. We're always looking to blame others in our acts of disobedience. And this is what Saul is doing. He's blaming others. And when he says, I said, he begins to listen to himself. And here is where he got in trouble. In verse 12, it says, I felt compelled. 
I don't know about you guys, but we know that our walk with the Lord has nothing to do with feelings and emotions. We can begin to say, well, I didn't feel like praying. Or we allow our emotions to get in the way to dictate our walk with the Lord. We allowed our emotions to compel us to do things on our own that God has not called us to do. And we see this perfect example of this symptomatic spiritual dullness that Saul has, believed that he can obtain the Lord's favor through an act of disobedience and blaming. He was blaming He would not take responsibility. He says here, I felt compelled. Thank God my my walk is not based on my feelings or emotions because I'd be in trouble. And this is where the beginning is that we're to trust in the Lord. We're not to trust in our own feelings. Do not lean in our own understanding. Because when we do, we will be compelled to do the things that bring disobedience to the Lord. And he lies. And he says that word compelled in verse 12 literally means forced to. I had to force myself. Well, if he had to force himself to do a burnt sacrifice, why couldn't he force himself to call upon Samuel? Why couldn't he force himself to call to the Lord? Why couldn't he force himself to call together some of the elders of Israel and offer prayers to the Lord? He could have beseeched the Lord for his help. You know, people are good today at making excuses, right? People, I'm good at it. I'm really good about making excuses, not going to the gym. Gym burgers, yes. It's cold outside. The mosquitoes are biting. My wife didn't wake me up. And we begin to make these excuses, and, and when we begin to make excuses, we, we can become good at it, and that is an indicator that we're rarely good in anything else. And those who are quick to blame others shouldn't complain if others blame them. When God confronted Adam, as I mentioned, with their sin, Adam blamed Eve, and then Eve blamed the serpent, but neither Adam nor Eve humbly said, I have sinned. And this is an example of a hardened heart, a heart that's not led by the Spirit, but led by self in crisis. And being led by the self, ourselves will never allow room for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Led by the self and by the flesh will always lead to decision-making that is done by how we feel. Moving on feelings and emotions never gives us victory, but rather brings us defeat. And when we look at verses 13 through 15, it says, Samuel, you have done foolishly. You, you haven't done good. And he's not calling him a fool. He's, what he's really telling him is that you've disobeyed. You, the, the stronger phrase is that you're not, doesn't mean that you're unintelligent or silly. It means that someone who is morally and spiritual lacking. In Psalm 14:1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt to do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. And in verse 13, it says, Haven't you uh, kept, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord. Well, what was the commandment of the Lord? To walk in his ways, to walk in his statutes and in his commandments, to walk in love. And my challenge this evening is, are we walking in obedience to the Lord? Especially when we're faced in crisis. Or have we made excuses to why we won't fully surrender our lives? Have we made excuses to why our walk isn't to where it needs to be because we're blaming our wives or we're blaming our husbands or we're blaming the dog or we're blaming whoever? Have we allowed circumstances to overwhelm us in such a way that instead of trusting in the Lord, we begin to hide and we begin to point the finger and we begin to say, but it was them. You know, when when I ask my kids, who did it? They're like, (laughs) and we do the same thing. We're to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. We're to follow the commandments of God. And uh, Samuel put it plainly, plainly that you have not kept the commandment of the Lord. If you would have kept this commandment, your kingdom would be established forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Saul's kingdom will last an extra 20 years from this point. And it says in verse 14 that the Lord has sought someone 
a man after my own heart. I want to be the commander of his people. Would you be consider a man or a woman that's after God's own heart? Or are you more like Saul who's followed his own heart? When faced with crisis that he begins to blame others. That it was you, Lord, who put me in this situation. And it was you who did this. Are we like that? Because if so, be careful that you're not walking in disobedience to God's word. Because God's word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not to lean on our own understanding. See, we have a choice tonight that when we're faced with crisis, either we're going to be a man or a woman that's after God's own heart and we will be established or we will be the men and women of disobedience who will run and hide at the sign of a massive army building against us. Samuel left Gilgal in verse 15. And it tells us here that when he left, he didn't offer a sacrifice. He didn't present anything to the Lord. And you know what's sad here in verse 15 as we're going to wrap it up? It says that there was only about 600 men that were with Saul. Isn't that crazy? He started off with an army of 3,000. But because he didn't trust in the Lord, because he didn't act in obedience, the people began to scatter. He had the opportunity to lead this army to the ways of the Lord. Just like we have the opportunity to lead our friends and family to the ways of the Lord. And we see that when there's disobedience and blaming, that there's loss. Because he started with 3,000 and now he's down to 600. This is the result of disobedience to the Lord. This is the result when we, get, we begin to blame others. Can we ask today? Can we answer ourselves? Are we men and women after God's own heart? Do we stand on God's promises? I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. Or do we allow circumstances in our life to overwhelm us and we begin to blame? See, God is searching for men and women that are after his own heart. Because he wants to establish us that we may fight this fight. That we may put on the armor of God. That we may stand in victory because our victory is in Jesus Christ. Our victory is in nothing else. So are you a man or a woman after God's own heart? Or are you a man or a woman that is after your own heart? See, God will give us the strength to fight our battles. Regardless of what the, what the circumstances look like, we can trust in the Lord because he is our rock and he is our salvation. And as Jesus Christ is the one that gives us the strength and we're to trust and put our hope and trust in him that we may be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we men and women after God's own heart?